All right. Well, let's get started. Welcome everyone to June's monthly member gathering for the Care Farming Network. Uh, as we were uh, thinking about topics and wondering about whether or not we would be hosting these in the summer months, knowing everyone's pretty busy, uh, we thought that animal therapy would be a cool topic to land on because there's a lot of member farms that are doing some uh, really neat work out there. And so uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Kate Mudge and I'm with Care Farming Network. Um, Andrea is also here from Care Farming Network and we have some presenters joining us too. Uh, the way that this works, if you haven't uh, joined one of these monthly member gatherings, is that we have a topic, we have presenters telling us neat stuff that they're doing in on their farm in their lives. Um, that will take about the first half an hour of the meeting. And then the second half of the hour, half of the meeting, um, for the last half hour, we open questions up. Um, if you have any questions for presenters, you're more than happy to um, use the chat function to type them in or wait until the second half and ask them yourself. Um, I think that might be about it. Uh, so again, I want to welcome our presenters. We're gonna start out with Karen and Kelly who are here from the Philly Goat Project. And the Philly Goat Project located in Philadelphia provides education, therapy, job training, wellness, and community engagement activities in partnership with the dynamic and delightful capacities of goats. They also have a super cool video. I don't know if that will uh, show up today, but welcome to you both, and I believe you have a presentation to share. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen, um, do my best to talk and share. Oh, where did it go? Hold on a second. Hold on. Oh, here we go. Wait a second. I see what happened. Uh, all right. Where did that go? Where did everybody go? Sorry. No problem. What's a Zoom meeting without a little bit of problematic share screen sharing, right? <laughs> Very true. All Perfect. Right. We can see that great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to sort of just talk and show pictures and do my best to get through what it is we do. Um, we are located completely, totally in the middle of Germantown in Philadelphia. Um, and I'm going to show you that we walk our goats in neighborhoods and in city parks. Uh, they go in a van and we have many double leads and the goats are trained to be walked by lots of different people. Um, as a social worker, it's really important to me where we are in terms of community. Um, the um, map here talk, shows a little bit of um, gun violence, poverty rates, um, and also we are located at Aubrey Arboretum's farm, if people are familiar with Philadelphia, but I want, this is an important photograph to look at green spaces, and I don't have to tell you guys what green spaces bring to wellness, um, but also look at the concrete spaces. Um, as a social worker, one of the um, guiding principles for me is addressing um, adverse childhood experiences and creating tangible, supportive, barrier-free programming for community members. And with Nadine Burke Harris's programming, some of the things that Philly Goat Project provides are um, physical activity, mindfulness practices, access to nature, supportive relationships, things like that. And I don't know if we can 
qualify an endless supply of granola bars as a balanced nutrition, but um, what, why isn't this advancing? Here we go. So we do a lot of different types of programming in the middle of the city um, with our goats, um, ranging from school visits to working with people who are in um, trauma programming, um, working with specifically um, dis populations who have physical and developmental disabilities. Um, I am a former social worker who worked in early intervention. So I do partner with a lot of team members. We create a lot of adaptive equipment. Here's one of our kiddos using an adaptive equipment to work on walking with holding a goat. Um, we use a lot of typical kinds of equipment to provide opportunities for engagement. Um, our goats are all trained to do verbal and nonverbal kinds of things. Um, we do have a wheelchair accessible area at the farm um, in the city. Um, and so um, these are just different pictures of us engaging with different people who have different needs with the goats. Uh, I know that you guys might have not known that goats can play Twister and know how to walk down the yellow line, but it is a learning and developmental skill. Um, we do try to have fun. Um, this is a really fun picture. You can see a six month change in how this child I'm working with with the goats is actually more making more eye contact, reading the book, being with the goat, being more engaged in reading with the goat. It's also like winter has come and we're in the barn. Um, and there's just different ways that our goats that are different than dogs or horses are very child size and able to be handled and in different ways than traditional animals that are used in therapy. Um, they're also, you know, very, very touchable. And we use a lot of different types of things at the farm to teach job skills training with special populations. This young man has autism and after working with us for a while, was able to get a job at Home Depot. Here, this is a program we're working with students from Pennsylvania School for the Deaf um, who don't often get a chance to do this kind of work. And these are our teen job training, teen job teen interns who um, feel very, very proud of, as you can see from doing things like mocking um, and riding around on a farm in, in a big truck. And our teens learn to take care of the goats and eventually they do get paid for working at a lot of our community events. This is a silly play that we do with um, various community programs um, and um, it's just a lot of opportunities for team building. We walk on city streets constantly. Um, and this is a really great, um, Kelly created this working with one of our kiddos with autism. Those of you who do therapy, um, this kid really likes to learn and know what's, what the activities are today. And he really has not much interest in working and playing with other people, but he will partner with a goat to, to learn to play a game and read a story and take turns. So we start with that. Um, so, oh, here he is using this. Um, I forgot I used this. So Kelly's giving him a choice of what color lead he wants to use. Now he's doing his snake deep breathing. Um, it's very cute. Here's um, another, this is our last picture. Um, Here's one of our visits to an autistic support classroom where we're teaching about body parts and that goats have four stomachs and you can listen to them. And about 15 minutes before this picture was taken, this kiddo really wasn't, was totally afraid of, of the goat and had never met a goat before. And here he is listening to Clementine's stomachs with us and having a really nice time. Um, and I think that's our website. We have. Um, YouTube channel with lots of videos. And I think, yeah, that's our last picture. How'd I do, 10 minutes? All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, those photos.
Yeah, it's hard to describe. It sounds very hokey, but when you see like a picture like this, it, it makes sense. Um, you know, do you want to go outside and take a walk at the park? No. Do you want to go with a goat? Get off your electronics? Absolutely. Um, so I will stop sharing. Well, thank you, Karen and Kelly. Um, and good job on 10 minutes. I didn't even have to jump in there and catch you off. So thank you. Um, just a reminder to anybody who might have joined a little bit past here, um, I forgot to mention that if you wanted to introduce yourself in the chat, it's always fun to see where people are joining us from. So feel free to do that, your name and your farm if you if you have one um, and your location. Um, and also, if you have any questions as uh, presenters are walking through stuff, feel free to throw them in the chat or again, we'll be able to um, after our next presentation, uh, open this up for others to ask themselves. Um, with that being said, I would like to next introduce Megan Moran, who's the executive director at Cultivate Care Farms. And Cultivate Care Farms is located in Massachusetts. They're a nonprofit organization continued to improving the lives of children and adolescents through farm-based therapy and community outreach. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to say those photos, Karen, from your presentation just made me very emotional. Just the beautiful work that you do with goats. Um, so, so thank you. <laughs> um, I'll also say that usually when I give this presentation, I'm going to give an abbreviated form. Um, but when we give uh, the larger presentation, what we end up doing is bringing in pygmy goats. Um, and we have people fill out a baseline of where their emotions are at prior to seeing the goats. And then we do some sort of activity, like we get them in a group to trim the hooves of the animals. And this will be like in a professional building with people in very nice clothing. Um, and then after they trim the hooves of the goats, we'll do a second um, uh, scale looking at emotions. And without fail, the positive emotions will go up and the negative emotions will go down. So um, I, I've definitely seen the benefit of people even getting just five minutes to spend time with a goat. So um, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint presentation up. And I, when I do my PowerPoint presentation, unfortunately, it fills up the entire screen. So I, I can't see anybody. So if you have a reaction or um, a question, uh, Feel, feel free to, to speak up. That's the only way I would know. Um, so let me see if I can do this right. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And we can see your screen wonderfully there. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I'm talking about the farm-based therapy that we do at Cultivate Care Farms. Uh, this image in front of you are um, small little, um, uh, I can't even think of the word of it, canvases that we sent out to kids during the pandemic. Um, and they actually painted these images that we put all together. So that's actually what our farm kind of looks like in real life. Um, I don't know if you can tell we have multiple sons at our farm. Um, and uh, a lot of rainbow and trans uh, clouds. So let me, so just in terms of what kind of farm-based therapy is, what we're doing is that we're working with clients and we see the, the mental health benefits by them working with the land and the animals. We wanna create a sustainable environment um, and definitely community with others. So in terms of what our land looks like, we have about five acres, um, but we're surrounded by wetlands and um, wetland buffer zones that we're not allowed to build on, but it does create for very interesting spaces. So in addition to our farmhouse and our barn, we have a fire pit, multiple animal pens. Um, we also have a trail that goes behind the farm near um, a small kind of waterfall. We have kids that actually build small houses out by the waterfall um, and bridges over a, just a small little uh, stream that is there. This past weekend, we actually had um, a memorial ceremony for two bunnies who have passed within the past six months. Uh, so we actually have a, a space, we call it the Memorial Forest, where our animals who have passed 
Um, we either bury them or, or they've been cremated. Uh, for a lot of our kids and our clients, it's the first funeral that they've ever attended. Um, for other clients, it's been really helpful for them to process uh, deaths or losses that they might have experienced during the pandemic and weren't able to kind of process in terms of with their family members. Um, oops, I accidentally changed that. Anyway, so so essentially this is, a, we're doing therapy in this space. There are 18 clinical spaces you had said or asked people, um, you were thinking more people might be outside. Uh, that's definitely where we're doing a lot of our work. Um, in terms of the animals that we currently have, we have a lot of goats. I find them incredibly therapeutic, and we're actually getting ready to have five new pygmy goats. Um, so we have alpacas, goats, sheep, um, chicken stocks, a turkey, a tortoise, uh, some cats, and some guinea pigs. Some of the animals we have, we have rescued. Some of them have been dropped off at our doorstep. Um, some of them have been born here, but currently we only have one fertile male. So we are interested in herd management and really looking at what are the therapeutic benefits to our clients of certain types of um, animals. I should say, well, I'll, I'll say it later. So um, these stats were kind of done uh, at the end of last year, so they haven't been entirely updated right now. We're averaging seeing about 144 clients a week. Um, I believe the average age is currently 15. The majority of our clients are kids and adolescents. Um, the major diagnoses that we are seeing um, are anxiety disorder, adjustment disorder. A lot of friends have ADHD or on the autism spectrum. And we're actually seeing a lot more um, uh, PTSD forms of trauma right now. Um, a lot of self-injury and suicidal ideation. So, and I apologize that I'm just kind of buzzing through all of this information. Um, I can return to it later if people have questions. That's one of my clients right there. He's in the um, part of the chicken coop uh, and just having a good time. <laughs> Um, so in terms of looking at how our work is different from traditional therapy, um, the similarities are we are seeing people once a week, um, they're hour-long sessions, we do take insurance, we do have treatment goals, we are keeping notes, um, we, uh, yeah, we've developed treatment goals, um, we monitor progress, um, so similar to traditional therapy, we're looking to empower our clients, we want them to be more confident, um, increase social connections and develop coping skills. Um, a lot of our I, I, mom recently told me that one of her kids, when I was just kind of asking, I was covering someone's paternity leave and asking kind of development or change that she was seeing in her daughter while she was receiving treatment at the farm. She said that she now sees her daughter as a confident risk taker. And I think that that's what we would want for all of our clients here. Um, also when needed, we do work with um, other providers, a lot of our clients have psychiatrists, some have in-home therapists as well, or participate in day programs. We have residential programs, bring their, um, uh, their kids here during the day. Um, they'll come twice a week. So, so we're seeing all different sorts of people with different needs. Um, for some, some clients, like this is re where the real work is happening. Maybe they've tried other forms of therapy before and it hasn't been effective. They try this. For other people, for families especially, if our goal is largely to help destigmatize mental health issues, it might be easier for a family with a small child to say that their child is going to the farm on Tuesdays versus saying going to therapy. Um, for some people, if they have multiple treaters, the farm can kind of function as a client's happy space. This is a, a place where they can, if they need to, just kind of zone out, um, do work, complete projects. Um, so major differences that we're uh, seeing between traditional therapy and our work here. And also just to say a lot of our clinicians, right now we have 12 clinicians. We all have varied backgrounds um, in more traditional settings. Um, so I worked in a therapeutic high school for 13 years. People have worked in private practices. 
a woman who fell in love with the goats. She calls herself the goat grandma. She worked in a, a male prison system for 25 years. Um, and there were triplet goats that were born and she's kind of taken them on as her, has her own and realized she could do really excellent care with kids here in this setting after having that experience. Another major difference is, is that clients and clinicians were working together. There's not this sense of I'm an expert and, um, uh, and you're, you're someone who needs a lot of help or someone who is ill, um, kind of like what Karen said in her presentation, she's a social worker, not a farmer. We're not farmers. We were not born um, doing this sort of work. So we're all kind of learning together. Um, the treatment is also public. So also in the interest of destigmatizing mental health issues, sometimes our clients are working together to help milk sheep. She's huge and we need multiple hands. Um, or sometimes an animal is being born. Um, so our clients end up kind of knowing each other or seeing each other around. Um, sometimes that can be really beneficial for a lot of kids who were isolated during the pandemic or who do have kind of social difficulties. This can be a safe place to connect. Um, so. so I just wanted to share kind of what the common components of what we're identifying as farm-based therapy is that all sessions involve some sort of hands-on experience. Um, we're really interested in sustainability. We were interested initially in um, harvesting our, our sheep's wool and turning it into yarn. We found that that hasn't been responded to. Um, it, it's been more expensive for us actually to, to do that process. Um, so right now we're really looking at uh, eggs and selling eggs to a local um, farm to table place. Um, we also have gardens where we're growing things specifically to feed to our animals. Um, in terms of the life cycle, like I had said, we're dealing with birth and death as it occurs. Um, we do have a, a vet who um, comes and helps us as needed, but we're kind of first uh, on call. And I think in terms of helping kids develop a sense of resilience and an ability to engage with kind of adversity, sometimes the farm presents opportunities where we need to get involved and help out an animal. Um, and uh, that can be really impactful for clients. Um, there's also a, a, an element of mindfulness. So like whether we're walking along the memorial path, whether we're um, really getting into the, the sensory pieces of the chicken coop itself, all the, the sounds, smells, um, th all the different colors and shapes of the different chickens. We also have a tortoise who um, we sometimes will put him outside with a balloon attached so you can see where he goes and just kind of mindfully following him um, along the farm can be a really helpful process. And then in terms of community, like I said, that we're, um, you know, we're seeing clients are, are in a more kind of public space. We're also like today we were able to give two scholarships to um, high school students going into the mental health field. We also try to identify other nonprofit organizations that support kids and families. Um, and so we just uh, and, and we also believe that sometimes if you're dealing with mental health issues, it can be easier to help someone else than it can be to help yourself. So really kind of boosting volunteerism for some of our clients who want to leave here. Um, it can be great for them instead of coming just for therapy to, to be here doing like morning feeding or morning chores. Um, but yeah, so so it's really important for us to be able to partner with organizations. Um, like we also partnered with um, Open Table, which is an organization that uh, serves as kind of a food bank in a local community. And so with our clients, we put together bags of food that kids could have during their um, breaks uh, if they, since they weren't going to be at school and be able to get kind of regular meals. Um, also, we have a, a pride event uh, once a year where we tie dye shirts. We invite people. It's free to come um, be on the farm and support each other. Um, yeah, so that's that. I guess maybe that's 10 minutes. That's where I ended it, but that's me if anybody has um, questions or wants to reach out. So I'll exit. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Let's see, we have um, a 
third presenter, I believe, but not 100% positive she's with us today. Jessica from Madison Fields. Yes, I'm here. There you are. Oh, okay. Your name, your last name was uh, sorry, appearing yeah, differently. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so, Jessica, you're a program manager with Madison Fields in Dickerson, Maryland. I am. Yeah. And I do have a couple slides if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, I don't know how to do that. Let's see. Down, down at the bottom, you should see if you're in kind of full screen on Zoom, there should yeah. be a green arrow going up saying share screen. Oh, I got it. Um, yep. Done. Okay. That's all right. There's a lot of stuff down there. Let's see. Make sure I share the right one. What they all say unknown. Do this one. Uh oh. Hold on. Sorry. No I'm, a farmer. I'm a far. I do farming, not technology <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, I think they're coming out with Zoom for farmers any day now. I know it's, they should. Well, yeah, it's, I've it's heard that that's a good. thing. Let's see. It says anyway, I'll just kind of start talking because it's starting to say for some reason that it can't do it. Um, so basically, so I, I work at Madison Fields and we I'm just gonna do it this way. Oh, it won't let me do it. Maybe Nancy, if I can send it to you and you can share it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Using my um it's not letting me do it. Nancy's on here too. That helps. Okay. So I am the director of development at, um, of director of operations at Madison Fields. And we are, it's 400 acres. It's in Dickerson, Maryland. And we run a variety of programs. Um, therapeutic riding equine assisted services is one of them. We also have the job readiness program, tons of volunteer opportunities, um, an ag education program. And we kind of dabble in a few other things, including um, soap making. I don't know if Nancy has shared with the group all of what we do, but um, basically, here are a, a few slides. Um, I'm here mainly to talk about uh, therapeutic riding. We do not actually have a mental health, a licensed mental health professional on staff. So we don't do your traditional, like we don't do it. We don't see clients in a ther therapy setting. We typically do therapeutic riding, um, which if you're not familiar, um, therapeutic riding is more activity-based than it is like a therapy. Um, so we have worked with licensed therapists. Um, we worked with, you know, speech pathologists and uh, really across the board, as well as um, like a hypotherapist, um, who else have we worked with? Psychotherapy uh, therapists who have all come out to the farm to use our horses and our program for their clients, um, but we don't tip. We don't actually have like clients on of our own. So these are just some pictures of some of the the, the people who have come out. We work with different ride. Basically, we're teaching the riding skill in a broken down way based on the participant. So I am not delving into any kind of mental health goals necessarily, um, although they're welcome to share, but I can't ask, you know, any of your, basically, how do you feel about that? I, I can't delve, delve into any of that with our clients. So we typically do like this, this gentleman down here on the, um, the black horse, that's Shay, and that's her rider. Um, he is a veteran who was wounded in a helicopter crash, and that's him working on balance and strength while he's riding with the, two of our volunteers. Um, so we work on things like that, so physical goals. Um, Nancy, you can go to the next slide. Let's see what that one is. Um, this is a little bit, we do have a couple goats and we are making goat milk soap and we try to include our participants in that. Um, we have a couple miniature horses that you can see here too that are always fun to have around. Um, that's uh, Ginger is the bigger one. Peter Pan is the small one. Um, and that is, they were invited to Children's National in DC 
to meet and do a meet and greet with all of the, the kiddos there and their families. They actually came down to the Ryan Seacrest studios there and kind of hung out with us. Um, and that was pre COVID. We haven't been able to go back since COVID, but that's sort of what we, we did with them and Pearl down there in the corner. Um, <laughs> she might as well be our mascot these days. Um, she is our pop belly pig. We can we call her our quarantine project? Um, and she's been very involved with, with all of our, our participants. She likes to help teach lessons too. Um, she's pretty much a hoot. But so we have we have a couple goats, we have chickens, we have pearl, we have horses, big horses and miniature horses. Um, and usually, and that's really all we use um, in, our, in our programs. A lot of our people don't like the chickens, meaning the therapeutic riding <laughs> kids don't really like the chickens. They like to take a trail ride down to the chicken coop. Um, but the job readiness program, which Nancy heads up and, and that's working with adults with disabilities, um, learning job training skills, both hard and soft or across the farm. Um, that's really where they, they take care of the chickens um, and the goats. And they actually make that goat milk soap. Um, they do everything from making it to selling it. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Side note about us. You can go to the next slide. Um, so equine assisted services sort of a compens is the new term that previously was stated as uh, equine assisted uh, ther activities and therapies. It just sort of put it into services. So it could include anything from hippotherapy, um, uh, equine assisted activities, therapeutic riding, um, and there's a, a few more like a driving, like a cart, pull, the horse is pulling a cart with participants. Um, and in order to teach the lessons, you typically need a certification. So Maggie, who is in instructing in, in all of these videos and these pictures, um, she is a CTRI, a Certified Therapeutic Riding Instructor through the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship International. It's a mouthful. Path International is what it's called. Um, I was, I, I am a equine specialist in mental health and learning. So Maggie is certified to teach therapeutic riding lessons um, in order she is trained to break each riding skill down in a manageable way for the client, depending on who, like what they're, or the participant, depending on what they need, both physically and or mentally. Um, and then ESMHL, Equine Specialist in Mental Health and Learning is another track. Um, and essentially I was trained to be the equine specialist in an environment where you have a mental health professional um, working with the horses in more of a clinical base, like where they're actually performing a, a like a true, what you would consider a therapy. Um, so therefore my job would be to watch out for the horse instead of um, the therapist job, which is watching out for the client. So if, um, for example, I was trained in, in a group setting that we were in, a participant was having a, a breakthrough and the horse needed to be removed from the situation safely so that that person could deal with the emotions that were coming up. So it was my job to then insert myself, remove the horse from the situation until it was safe for the, the equine to return. Um, Nancy, you can go to the next slide. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm just talking. This is uh, one of the group sessions that we had at the farm. Um, this was in partner with a mental health professional. And this was, um, this is our indoor and we basically do a herd observation where we turn these horses out in the in the arena together and watch them interact. Um, we do this with groups across the board. It's just they some of these horses have been together, had met each other over the fences, and usually we throw in one or two curve balls who have not interacted with each other. And basically, we we, we observe what they do. You know, obviously, they're equines, they're horses. They you know, they have their own minds and their own opinions about things. So they might squeal at each other. They they typically, what I have found is every single time we've done this exercise, the people who are watching are taking away like tons of things in their own lives that they can reflect in there um, and what they see in the horses. Like I had an at-risk youth group come out and 
the horses looked like they were bullying each other. And at first they were drawing conclusions as like, oh, that horse is mean. She's bullying the rest of them. And she's trying to keep her friend from hanging out with this friend. And then all of a sudden I started divulging, I started giving more information. So like, what if I told you that that horse that she's protecting or she's standing between is, has a disability, not a physical disability, but she has a disability you can't see. How would that change your perception of what's going on? Um, so just giving them information about the horses and letting them draw their own conclusions and, and reflect on, on how that impacts them. This one, we actually did a join up exercise as well. So that's what's going on in the black and white photo. Um, they kind of worked to join up with a horse and that's the horse that they groomed for the rest of the day and kind of got to hang out with. Next slide. Hey, Jessica, this is Kate yeah. here. Um, just to keep things on time and allow for some Q&A, um, I'm sorry to do this, but yeah. if you could just You're wrap fine. things up in a, in a minute or so. That's pretty much then, it, actually. Um, okay, this is just gotcha. a couple things that we do extra, like yoga and um, a couple people that we partner with to do different things across the farm, but that's it. Nope, yep, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Ending with goat yoga. Yeah, fantastic. And mini horses. We turn our mini horses out there too with the goats and they all get to hang out. Well, thank you all. I love the pictures. Um, and it's it's cool to see how unique your um your programs are and what you're adapting uh this work to and the people that are receiving it. So um, I want to remind anyone that you, this is a time for Q&A for any of the presenters or to share information that you might uh, think others would be interested in. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself if people start kind of talking or tripping over each other. You can also use the chat function and I can um, pose some questions. I know that Karen had uh, written in chat was asking about the educational background of employees. And I think potentially she was asking that to you, Karen, when that chat came through or message came through. So for Philly Goat Project, um, I and Kelly are licensed social workers, um, but my 30 years of experience is in working in special ed. So I was someone who was trained in ABA, uh, as the person who was responsible for carrying over any kind of skills from the classroom to the home and the family. Um, and then conversely teaching, um, fam uh, teaching teachers how to engage with families who might have their own challenges in learning um, and adapting any skills that were being taught to their kids by the therapeutic staff. So working very closely with speech, OT, PT, um, as, as well as behavioral therapists. Um, and so, um, and in terms of special education and, 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 um, and ad adapting our educational programming, we have a range of consultants who both work with the goats and work with us for adaptive curriculum um, and adaptive equipment. And um, also we do train the goats every day to be with a range of different people to accommodate noises, police sirens, ice cream trucks, um, wheelchairs every morning, they, they are fed meals on wheels with a wheelchair because um, <laughs> um, they can be skittish around different equipment. Um, and so we have a, a wheelchair <laughs> as part of our um, morning feeding, um, different things like that. So it's a, it's a hybrid method. There's a specific question in the chat too about the training process for the goats from Nancy, um, how about you'll you're touching on this preparing them to work with a variety of people in settings when we just use traditional clicker training um with everything that we do um just like any other it, you know we just use a lot of clicker training um standard kind of stuff no magic <laughs> i think it was um megan who uh 
spoke about having people in an office trim goats hoofs. And I was just shocked by that because as someone who's had goats for 15 years, they hate to have their hoofs trimmed. So I, I, how do you do that? I just can't even imagine that happening. I mean, I think because our animals are used to being handled by people and, and want to be close to people also, a lot of times our animals that we get have potentially been rejected by their animal moms and so are used to being raised by people. Uh, so I think, um, I don't know, that's just, it, it's, it's, it seems to work. I, I get more surprised by how the people are responding than the goats themselves. They kind of, they seem into it. Thanks, similar to Megan, what Megan said is, I mean, our, we have, over a hundred volunteers and lots of shifts. So from the minute that our goats come to our farm, um, you know, they're raised by being touched and handled by lots and lots of different people. And we purposely try to have a range of people um, handling them to accommodate that and, and acclimate that and generalize that. Um, I, I get that, but, um, and I don't wanna take up any more time, but I just, the hoof part, I don't get. If you have a trick, please share it with me because um, uh, my animals are certainly have a lot of contact as well, but hoofs are not something they like to have trimmed. So how, how do you do that? Is there some trick to that part? Well, usually if we're going into the office, these are pygmy goats, so they're smaller. Sometimes we roll them onto their back, similar to you would that you would with like a sheep being sheared. So they're a little calmer. Um, and if you have multiple people who can like scratch their backs, do it in a calming way, you give um, multiple people little trimmers, it can be done pretty quickly. We have a milking stand and we put grain in the milking stand. So they're they they can't really go anywhere, um, but the grain keeps them occupied. And then I usually have a student petting them uh, while we do that because that is that it, they do not like to have their hooves trimmed. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, Becca. Do you recommend? Do any of you recommend a specific breed of goat that's best for this kind of work? I, I don't think it has to do with the breed. <laughs> I, goats are really nice. Like they're, they're big dogs. Um, they, we also, we have, we have um, Nubians, uh, Sonnens and a Toggenberg. Um, and it, it took them a little while because we, they were not socialized at all um, when we got them. Um, so that's important, just exposing them to people, but um, I, we haven't had any issues or they're, they're all very, very, <laughs> they want to be, they want to be touched and loved <laughs> and fed. <laughs> okay, great. That's good to know. I, I have one other, oh, sorry. Just quickly, sorry. I, I do have a preference. I mean, I, 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 I love all of our goats, but I find that Nubians who are larger, like big dogs are also really communicative, um, so I, I enjoy that. And then in terms of like pygmies, because we are working with, um, younger kids that can be really helpful, um, as well, but I, I would agree that goats are generally pretty, pretty friendly. So. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, I have one other question relating to the goats. I believe one of the speakers talked about how they made goat milk soap as one of the activities. Curious about we we were interested in goat milk as well, but to get goat milk, you have to you know breed the goat, right? So to continuously have a supply of milk, what do you do with these babies that are born? So we only had we were only milking the goats for one season, and we had five goats, and it has made enough oh. milk for us for like what are we going on four years now, Nancy? Uh, yeah, we have enough to make, we got enough milk to make about uh, 15,000 bars. <laughs> so we just froze it. Every single freezer, which is like every single building that we have is full, was full of goat milk soap. So we like, <laughs> I mean, goat milk. So we started slowly waning down, but um, that was one season. And we, we milked until um, they started to like 
dry up a little bit and and then we just kind of weaned down off of that um but it made enough for a solid four years of, of pumping out enough soap so even if you had you know one or two and then you know the kidding was part of your program and your organization also sorry this one woke up and said hi, wanted to say hi um so then that could be part of your programming and then once they wean you just yeah either you can keep them or you could try to sell them okay the kids but yeah we made a we made a, quite a bit of soap i mean milk in one just one season of, of having them okay good to know thank you we don't actually we don't milk them any we haven't ever since then we haven't bred or milked them okay Anyone else have a question? And also, if you're here wanting to share any information about what you might be doing or thinking about, please do. Please feel free. Karen, I have a question for you. The photo that you showed of the boy with autism, um, that was a powerful photo. I'm just curious, like in terms of using animals, uh, you had mentioned that maybe he wasn't as responsive to people. And that there was something about the the goat that really spoke to him. I mean, any any reasons or rationale why animals can have the benefit that they do in therapeutic practices? There, I mean, so with our friends with autism, they can their sensory world can be pretty overwhelming. And it's sort of for my feeling with this particular kiddo was that we, before that photograph, we had had brushes and were brushing him, uh, brushing the goats. And he, uh, he we, we also had photographs of the goat so he could actually see a picture of the goat and look at the goat. And there were some introductory um, tools that we used to help acclimate him and help him sort of organize his feelings and his reactions in a, in a whole body way. So sort of the goat also like physically we we had you know you can see our goats have halters on and so he had control over his proximity to the goat. The goat wasn't moving. We had photographs of we have a um, like who's who and he could sort of picture like find the picture of the goat and then match it with the goat that we had um anything else that you can think of kelly that in terms of um tools that we use to kind of acclimate him that little boy um they had also sort of got we have a PowerPoint that we send to the schools about the goats. So kids with autism tend to be really focused on visual learning. So it was something that wasn't the first time he was seeing images of the goat that would be coming to his school. We also talk a lot. We have a video specifically about poop. It is on our website. It's funny, but We've really put a lot of work into our PowerPoint because we find that, and this is for adults too, who aren't used to animals and where cleanliness, it can be a real somatic reaction, um, is talking about poop in advance helps people to, in their whole body, kind of prepare and, um, have a little bit of control over the situation. Otherwise, when when we have done visits with anybody um, who's not familiar with animals, when the animal poops, all we lose them. They're just reacting instead of engaging. So there's a lot that we um, do in terms of of planning. We also had a worksheet that has. Um, a human body and a goat body. And so how do you, it matches like for that age group that we work with the teacher in advance. So like how, you know, how are your, how do your eyes look? How do Clementine's eyes look? 
How do you move? How many legs do you have? So just like conversations where we don't expect the friend, the student to like, here's a goat, you can touch them. There's so many different levels of engagement that we approach very deferentially um, when working with folks who are new to the goats. And on this web, on this Zoom also is an, a parent who has a kiddo who's part of our therapy team. I don't know, Sana, if there's anything you wanna add um, to talking about adapting, visiting the goats or, you know, so we, we try to have, we also have icons, visual icons for kids who are nonverbal so they can um, have a sense of when they want to stop. Um, so just having our staff really well trained and tuned in to take that person's lead, whether it's a child or an adult. Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have time for one more question. Really quick, Gracie's getting an echo. Is anybody else getting an echo? Okay, yeah. Gracie, that must be on your end. But Christine has a question from Blue Barn Farm in New Jersey, asking um, any of the presenters just to share uh, briefly about how your farms got started, your origin story. Megan, did do you want to do kick us off or just real short? Sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, Cultivate Care Farms was originally um, a rehabilitation center and a residential program for adults with substance use issues and major mental health issues. Um, I believe that was in 2017. I came in 2018 um, and became the director in 2019. And I think just through the pandemic, this became a place, it was like one of the only places where kids were getting to go to over the course of their week. They weren't going to school. They were, um, this was a place where they could be outside and, and feel safe. And so um, I think since that time, we've definitely ended up seeing more children and, um, and adolescents. So that's kind of our origin story. Thanks. And Philly Goat Project, Karen or Kelly? wasn't a straight road um, at all. Uh, really, depending on what day you talk to me, I'm not sure, but 30 years working in the city, um, looking at um, what the um, components of um, barrier-free programs that directly address trauma in an urban environment are comprised of, and believe it or not, that's how we came up with goats. We are one of the only very uh, city-based goat programs right now. And if you travel around the world, you know, all of you guys know that goats live everywhere, but... Um, we were very fortunate to have an arboretum that's in the city accessible and public transportation allow us to start this program. I, I, I had my full-time job for the first year, invested my own money in this program. Uh, I was inspired in 2016 to make a difference um, and, and give it a go. And it's been somewhat successful. We are loved by about 15,000 people a year. We work very hard on um, gigging all over the city um, and also grant writing and fundraising. Um, so we, we have very uh, indirect ways of getting money. That's a constant source, as all of you, I'm probably sure, struggle, struggle with also. So um, it's, we, we've had many, um, there are many things we used, we did that we don't do anymore that didn't turn out to really be um, mission focused and safe for us. We used to do grazing in the city and we don't do that anymore. And we used to do goat yoga and we do happy hour instead because all our, our Nubian goats speaking 
with, you know, heartening to Megan's um, reference, our Nubian goats couldn't cuddle using goat yoga, just our Nigerians. So, um, Interesting. we make it up as we go along sometimes and some things happen by accident, um, which is the nature of any kind of family, right? <laughs> and Jessica or Nancy, did you wanna? Yeah, we have a kind of a different story. Um, our The farm was gifted to a local foundation called the Madison House Autism Foundation that was doing some advocacy work, um, more trying to be more nationally based advocacy advocacy work due to the pr proximity to the, the capital. So um, the farm was gifted to the foundation um, and they sort of started to look at what a local project might be like. So the buildings were all there when we got there, including like our ramp, um, the inside the arena, all of that was there. The, the gentleman that worked was there before his daughter, oh, he was a very wealthy uh, lawyer in DC and his daughter ran therapeutic riding out of that facility for free for just um, really anybody in the area that wanted it. Um, so we, they chose to keep that tradition of equine assisted services and then sort of came through working towards um, trying to align it more with the, the foundation's mission of helping adults on the spectrum um, in a variety of ways. And then we just in helping them and working with therapeutic riding, we just started sort of picking away at, at some of the other stuff we started to do. Um, but we're your typical nonprofit, <laughs> familiar and wearing all the hats and um, trying to raise money every way we can, so. Well, we're approaching the end of our time together. And so I just wanted to really send out a special thanks to um, everyone who presented and sharing information, as well as everyone who showed up and was part of the conversation today. Uh, we usually have these uh, the first Thursday of every month, July, with the uh, holiday. We're going to be taking a hiatus, but we'll let you know when the next gathering is uh, online. And then uh, we'll also be sharing this out for folks that want to rewatch it or share it with others. So you can find it on our website. Have a wonderful weekend to everybody. And thanks again.